Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Data Diversity. We are proud to produce this healthcare special interest group for the Data Governance Professionals Organization and we'd like to thank you for joining today's DGPO. Um, Healthcare first one of this event, um, just or of this format anyway. <laughs> Excuse me. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted, especially for the presentation portion of the uh, presentation. However, for questions, we'll be clicking them via the Q and A section in the bottom right hand corner. And to combine the previous format of the conference call with this new webinar format, uh, if you raise your hand at the when we open up the Q and A, we will unmute you individually and may unmute everyone at the end for an open discussion. Um, now let me turn the webinar over to Davida to kick us off. Davida, hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Um, I'd like to thank you and Data Diversity for giving us this platform. And um, I'd like to welcome everyone to our meeting today. Okay, um, before we turn this over to Ted, I just want to do a, a little bit of background about why this group is formed and what the plans are for the future. Um, people who are not in healthcare who are members are asking, you know, why is there a healthcare dedicated group? If we look at membership, nearly 25% of our members are from healthcare and health related industries. Um, so, what is this group and who can participate? This is open to all members, there's no restrictions. This is open if you are a consultant or if you are a vendor, as long as you're a DGPO member, you're more than welcome to participate. And this is formed as a special interest group, not a working group. And we differentiate that by this presently is more or less a discussion group um, where we share information and facilities discussion on the issues that um, practitioners are addressing in data governance healthcare, as opposed to a working group where we're going to develop a work product. This may change in the future, but you know, as we start up, we're, we're starting out as a special interest group. Okay, uh, the plans are right now that the meetings will be held every other month and we'd like to try to give the same time each month so you can um, mark save the date on your calendar, which will be the third Wednesday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, we'd like to try to get several people to volunteer to moderate so that um, all the pressure is not just on one person, we have backups. So if you are interested in being a moderator, you know, please let uh, please let me know or Sal, who's going to uh, talk in a couple of minutes. Now, the plans for the next meeting, which would be in February, is, would be a panel discussion. Um, the subject of that would really be based on the panelist. So if you're interested in being a panelist, please email us. We'll have a call with the panelists and then we'll determine what the, if we're just going to talk about their implementation or specific issue. Now, um, we are creating a dedicated member mailing list because we know people who may be in finance who are members um, may not want to get these emails. So everyone who's attending today will be on this list. And if um, you know anyone else who's a member who would like to be on this list, you know, just let us know. We're also going to plan for some sort of in-person meeting in June at the DGIQ conference maybe a dinner, maybe a get together. As um, the, the year progresses, um, we'll come up with something and get, get feedback from everybody. So um, there have been questions about relationships and sponsorships. We do not have a relationship, nor do we sponsor or endorse any other healthcare special interest group. As I mentioned, we are not planning on developing any work products, but this may change in the future. Email and contact information and participants will not be open or shared. Now what this group will not do and what we will not discuss, we need to be vendor neutral and that does not mean anti-vendor but it means we cannot promote one vendor over another. So any tool recommendations and detailed discussion of tool functionality, we don't want to really get into that. but. If you're presenting or discussing something, you know, feel free to mention what tools that you use, but it really cannot be 
in-depth discussion. The same about the consultants who may have worked for you and who you liked and maybe who you didn't like. Okay, and this group is just going to be focused on the areas of data governance specific to healthcare, not just general data governance. Now, I'd like to turn this over to Sal, the treasurer of the DGPO. Hi, everyone. Hope you're having a great uh, Wednesday afternoon. Uh, as Davida said, my name is Sal Pasriello, and I am the treasurer of the DGPO. Um, today, Ted Curran, Senior Director and CDO Officer for University of Pittsburgh Medical Center Insurance Services Division, will be leading uh, a discussion on UPMC's data governance um, communication strategy. Um, Ted leads the development, build out, and implementation of data governance, information asset management, and business intelligence activities across UPMC's insurance services division. He has very deep um, management accounting experience and managed the finances and business operations for the Tepper School of Business at Carnegie Mellon. He also serves as an expert advisor and consultant in business intelligence, development of dashboards, financial operations, and data governance to the higher education, healthcare, and government industries. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Ted uh, to talk about uh, the communication tools that are being leveraged uh, at UPMC. Ted? Terrific. Thanks, Sal. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I'm Ted Curran. As Sal mentioned, communication tools being leveraged in healthcare data governance is going to be the focus. I'm um, going to cover just a few slides um, just to kind of let you know some of my experiences and hopefully can share and collaborate because I'm still kind of learning and figuring these things out as well. UPMC is what they call an IDFS or Integrated Delivery Finance System. Um, it's about seven to eight billion on the insurance side and seven to eight billion on the provider side. I oversee the data governance efforts for the insurance side and work very closely across that. And I'll get into some of the specifics um, as well. Um, so for uh, a number of us were got together in San Diego at the DGIQ, and then there was a call organized in September really around um, was there enough interest, and there seemed to be a ton of interest in this. And I'm, my focus here is really going to be um, just following a kind of the, the, the process that we talked about, which is giving a present, brief presentation, then hopefully having some good Q&A discussion and collaboration, because I'm really looking forward to collaborating with so many of you kind of in the future. I've had a few calls with a number of folks that I've met since then, and it's been a great way for us to network and share information. Um, but obviously, uh, the goal here is to, sh is to share knowledge and things across the area, and I'm glad that we have both a mix of consultants and also folks that are working um, within a series of healthcare companies. Um, again, as Sal mentioned, feel free to use the Q&A to put through questions, and then hopefully we'll cover all those, and we'll make sure that we can uh, have some level of kind of more open discussion. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I think, in general, when you start getting into communication techniques, I think it's really important to kind of understand your situation. Um, for me, um, you know, in my situation, we're talking double-digit growth program and market expansion, and a company which has over 65,000 employees, but on the insurance side, the side that's driving, again, about half the revenue, the payer side, it's only about 5,000 employees, which for those of you that are active in healthcare, it makes sense. You're going to have a lot more employees to drive a hospital system doctors, nurses, all the different um, fantastic functions that we have there. Um, but when, when I first moved to Pittsburgh to take a position at Carnegie Mellon, we had a couple hundred thousand people um, that were in the health plan, and it was just a small component. And now the, the, uh, the health plan has over three million members. So you're in an area of extreme growth, and I think that's really important when you think about how they've kind of pushed and leveraged existing um, systems and kind of how do you go about communicating effectively when people are kind of you know, in this heavy growth mode. Um, and, you know, lots of people are being hired, new teams are being brought on, there's a significant amount of merger and acquisition. The need to tailor messages to different populations. Um, I think this is really key, because you're gonna have certain messages that are gonna kinda go out to really, really broad groups. There's certain messages that I've been putting out to people across UPMC, leveraging channels such as 
um, newsletters that kind of go out to all of UPNC. There's been some specific communications to senior leadership, to my advisory board, to your champions or data stewards, um, different parts of the UPNC organization. And, um, and then really even within um, the payer side have been kind of trying to lay out some individual distinctions or kind of working with specific groups. So you have your traditional payer, your health plan side, and then you get into things like we have um, a very thriving center um, for research. We have business lines like pharmacy that often have some unique needs around these things and have some specific systems that may not be applicable to other areas. And I think that's been something that, um, that's taken me a little bit of knowledge to know, even though I've worked quite a bit in the industry. Access to tools quickly and simply in a 24-7 environment. This is no sur surprise to anybody. Um, qualitative and quantitative goals. Some areas have clear goals on revenue, expenses, KPIs, marketing goals. Um, a lot of other areas are looking for help, and in some cases are really looking for me to collaborate with them on helping them with the value proposition. Um, you know, and, and that's really, I'm a management accountant at trade. I spend a lot of time helping them put numbers to things that are not financial. What's the value if we can, you know, focus on the brand, if we can be more consistent? And then, you know, other things as well, if we can be more efficient and we can free up resources to do these things. And then, of course, message consistency with our stakeholders, external parties. I mentioned regulators here, but also with vendors, with TPA arrangements. It's really an area, too, that I'm focusing quite a bit on our messaging and also kind of our overall policies. How do we make sure that we're supporting not just who you would think of as your traditional stakeholders, but much broader group that's very important? Um, so as we get into some of these communication tools, um, I do a monthly newsletter, and I have, I have a fancy logo here that was created through marketing that's using the official UPMC colors, and I also blog weekly to biweekly. One of the real key things with that is you have to stay focused on it. Um, the blogging is a lot of fun. The data governance cake, people used to joke, is it fat-free, cholesterol-free? Um, but it's really been a nice way to tie into some really specific messages. Um, and really, whether it's the newsletter on a monthly basis, which I have a, a very large audience, I think, for, for, for an item that's had less than um, seven months of, uh, of shelf life, I have over 500 users just on the insurance services division side. So, you know, just over 10% of the employees um, subscribe to the, the newsletter. Um, but driving subscription engagement and then really focusing on current items. So a lot of times I talk about things, but as you'll notice here, even if you're, for those of you that are kind of following along in the slides, I start tying in very specific things to them. So at UPMC Insurance Service Division, we're looking to streamline this, 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 and this. You've told me in this case, when we were growing here, I found that we found these things. So really trying to personalize it to our business as opposed to, you know, kind of high level, um, you know, things about data governance. I try never to sweat the terms like data stewards and these things. I try to focus as as little kind of focus on those things as possible, as much on the substance and being available and making this as useful as possible. And then as I mentioned here, data tools such as data from tools like MailChimp, it's really important to me to understand who's opening it or groups doing it or, or is there specific things I need to be doing or are certain groups opening other, certain items much more uh, regularly than others and making adjustments from there. As I go on here into the, the blogging, um, Blogging, I don't think it's something that is natural for, for a lot of us that are doing data governance. Um, you know, you start, you have to almost have a voice. When you look at some of the most successful bloggers, even at even some of the data governance conferences, they have a tremendous voice. I know a number of the folks at these events are just excellent speakers. For me, it's been really establishing a voice that connects in the style. Um, an item I wanted to highlight, and, and this might be consistent with what you've seen or not, but I've really, really focused on collaboration and set expectations crystal clear what's up front and not, and what isn't. Um, I really want people participating. And what I, one of my biggest fears that I wanted to nip at the bud right from the start was certain things that may be inappropriate. So if you think about social media in general, I mean, sometimes I'm afraid to put things on Facebook or in Twitter because of some of the, frankly, nasty stuff that comes back. It's not that I'm not thick-skinned, but I, I don't want folks shutting down. And there's a number of topics where people have issues with other groups and other things that I've had to make it clear that I think they're important, but I, I don't want to be kind of having those things in a public forum. Um, and so, and I really wanted to make the forum as, as open and collaborative as possible to have people opening and asking things and made it clear that there aren't stupid questions. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of things I, I can tell you on the, the medical side, the why I've worked in it, I, you know, I'm, I'm a complete novice. 
I think of somebody like Len Silverstein or good old Zen with Len about taking a breath and instead of this nasty gram war, speaking directly and having a misunderstanding. And I've, I've used some of his techniques on these things. Um, but there's a lot of the things from different practitioners that I've been leveraging. So as I mentioned here, here's kind of two parts of examples where I, I put here on the piece about blogging, lots of data, but what about results often tie to an article I've read. In one case here, it was around through the MIT Sloan Review where they were talking about companies having more data than ever. Um, but are we showing the value and really focusing on are we getting the value out of the different data types that we have? If you'll notice here in another piece that I pasted, I start talking about very specific systems to our area, you know, that we have a tendency to focus on what we know, an Oracle report, an MC400, which is our claim system, a Google Analytics chart. It's the, the systems themselves don't matter. But I know this one in particular caught a lot of things because I made it clear to people that in my experience with senior management that a lot of the reports y'all are sending in, nobody cares about. That's not what they're looking at. And that we really need to actively listen um, to, to, to leaders and understand what is it that that you need? What is it that would be most valuable? Um, and I know that blog created a lot of uh, a lot of interest and a lot of people said, you know, I always wondered if, if people are really looking at these things. I really want to focus on the things that will help leadership kind of understand what's most important to our area, whether it's tied to claims or quality or other areas. Um, and so I feel like I'm only scratching the surface in that area with blogging. Um, collaboration. Um, I mentioned things like SharePoint, your intranet, collaboration tools like Slack. I feel like, um, and obviously any tools, even Microsoft, you have different tools, not just Slack, but things like Teams. But I just feel like we have scratched the surface on this area. And you might say, well, well why? And I think it's, there's just a huge opportunity to get info to people clearly. So you, you can see the size of my organization. We're, we're, not, we're not small. So to get information owners or data stewards or people to be able to send stuff to each other quickly, you know, how is everybody using this field in our data warehouse? Um, integration of tools, um, you know, in the, in the case of Slack, we've, we've leveraged things like Trello or Jira. We do a, we're doing more and more work around Agile, um, work, WordPress with Workflow, GitHub, code management. There's so many tools um, that you can put into these things. And what I, what I also have found, too, is the grouping in history. A number of folks have said, I couldn't remember something, but I remember you put the committee charter, you know, out on our collaboration people. I was able to see the comments people made. It was all organized. Um, and, and so for me, um, the people that are using it um, are getting a ton of value. So I, I need to figure out ways to make it really, really simple for people. A couple people have had me have it so that, or I um, have asked IT to have it start when they, when they start their computer up in the mornings or putting these things on their tablets. And so th this is an area where I've made progress, but it's an area where I feel like, given the people that are using it, and I'll admit, we have a number of millennials that just love this stuff. Some of them even get um, notifications through Facebook when things pop up. Um, but I just think of all ages, we can, uh, you know, myself included, we can be really um, connect, communicating more effectively across areas using some of these tools. Um, and I think it's a critical area for collaboration for us in data governance. Um, being accessible, um, and you know, I've spent a lot of time, and I don't know if this is it resonant with for everybody, and maybe we can talk about it, or people can type things in the Q&A area, but I have spent a ton of time kind of helping people understand, you know, my, you know, what's data governance versus privacy, privacy protections, controls, there's a lot more that we deal with in privacy besides just HIPAA. Um, you know, the, the operational focus of data governance and, and all the different ways we support, and then the information security area, which is, for us is in the IT area and the establishing of technical administrative controls to ensure that data is properly secured. There's no question that there's a lot of issues that kind of require an integration of our areas, and then broader compliance areas like fraud, waste, and abuse, or uh, quality control, et cetera. I've also found that it's been tremendously valuable to work with the teams in the trenches. I've spent a lot of time with the people handling the millions of claims, um, making sure people are supported but not under a microscope. Um, I, a lot of folks add me to their messenger. We use messenger tools. They send things back and forth. I know I've had to use a little bit of caution. I'm, I'm Finance Ted on Twitter. I'd love for you all to follow me. I can follow you back. Um, I, it looks like whenever I put this slide together, I have 2,579 users, which is not bad for a person that does finance and data all day. Um, but, and, and I love when folks kind of send me private messages, but a couple people have used the at finance Ted handle and kind of gotten into something that's specific to UPMC, and I, 
I've just taken those things offline. I've had to spend a lot of time when I've sat with folks in the trenches listening and at times biting my tongue where, gosh, I wouldn't have answered that that a customer is answering that way, um, but really took a lot of their information that I saw in the trenches and put it into a training, which was a mix of video and voice. And what was fantastic with that was HR made up mandatory training for all of UPMC Insurance Services Division. So not, at, not only did everybody have to do it once a year as part of a back-to-school type of training, but now every new, new hire gets exposed to this. A lot like when probably all of us had to go to probably training if you're part of a health organization, you learn to wash your hands and the basic rules. For me, it's like data governance for washing your hands. And so just a great way of connecting kind of data management into um, the insurance services division. And you might say, well, why did they do that? Why did they allow that? And it's because, let's face it, data is a critical component of every one of our strategic priorities. And so I made that case effectively. And in only being here a year in this position, you know, have things that are woven into the fabric and the culture of this place. Um, analyzing the impact of, of communications. I'm constantly setting, what are the goals? What do we need to monitor in the format? How does the data impact decisions, change activities? How does it matter? You know, if I blog stuff, is, are people asking? Are people asking different questions? Are they communicating more? Um, are there certain topics that are, that are resulting in higher interest? Um, you know, as I mentioned before, things like third-party arrangements, acquisitions of growth. What kind of communications do we need to have for vendors? Spend quite a bit of time on other topics, um, you know, trying to make sure that we were focusing on specific needs, um, you know, that were more forward-looking at tied to goals. You know, okay, we're, we just were doing um, budgeting. How do you make sure that data pieces are a part of that, and how can I support you in those areas? Um, but really putting numbers to things, you know, wow, you, 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 we lear I learned something from you. In fact, I'm, I'm doing some work internally in showing, you know, the processes um, within my own compliance area around how I'd like to see folks using Excel better. And a number of folks have said, if you can help solve this and make this more efficient, we have, we have 10 plus people that are working on this. And I can give you a dollar amount that's tied to every hour we save. So that's me tying the impact of communications and then the work that we're doing. I hope that makes sense to everybody. Um, and so, really, as we um, we kind of start to, to, to wrap up here, I, I think I think there's a, a lot of focus on what's working and what may be useful. But I've been really careful on the fact that we don't want to wait for things to be perfect. But I don't pilot an experiment without getting people confused. I've tried to make sure that when I'm kind of pilot or checking something, I have a critical mass. And one of the reasons is, is that I've just found that people have a history, good, bad, and indifferent, with IT areas, with compliance areas, and with data governance. And so I don't want to over-test things and say, oh, we're rolling out a new one, and then we're rolling out another one, and we're rolling out another one. And so I've tried to at least uh, make adjustments, and I've been willing to make changes to, to you know, the, the options, make things more flexible. Heck, if we need to open up after this webinar, we're, we're going to make it flexible. We'll have people click the little button to raise their hand, but if we need to open it up to get people talking, we will. But I haven't just blindly started throwing tools out there. And I think that's also helped as well, that people know that I'm not constantly slamming things at them because they're getting things from everywhere. Think about how large our organizations are. I'm managing 28 information owners. I was hoping for it to be around 15 to 20, but you know, 28 different areas that have very specific needs. Um, where we've mitigated risk, helping a unit, you know, where is it working, making sure other areas are knowing it. I feel like a critical part of my, about of my job is, and obviously we're not, today we're not talking about policies, but communicating what's worked, what isn't working. We have a data set here. I'm really pushing on making sure that if it's appropriate, that it should be being leveraged in other areas. How can we maximize the value of some of these assets? And then removing these legacy products. Um, I have a target of, a number of, of the number of legacy databases that I want to remove in partnership with the project management office and the IT area. Um, can't get the communications right without marketing and internal communications. From them reviewing things that I'm about to publish on, on newsletters to logos to them putting things into broader things that aren't data governance specific and tying these things in to really connecting across the um, governance risk and compliance area to things that are being pushed out by IT and, and kind of cross-marketing cross things. Making it simple. I, I know I always tell people how my internet might look really simple, but they, boom, here's our content, here's our forms, here's our policies, here's our procedures, here are the questions people have asked, you know, 
and keeping it current. You have to force yourself to keep it current. And so I hope this kind of got you going. I hope you could take two or three things out of here and you say, yeah, that was interesting, or maybe we should try this, or we've been going here, and gee, I've had a different scenario, and you want to ask a question. So with that, I was kind of thinking about what, what SIG members are looking to tackle in their communications, and how can we better support each other? I really hope that it's, a, uh, it's an opportunity for us to, uh, with this SIG, to really, really communicate. I know I am more than willing to answer questions and support any of you any way I can. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sal to uh, moderate any kind of Q&A that's come in and uh, hopefully have some discussion here today. I hope that was useful. Sure, thank you. Um, Ted, uh, we have one question that came through from um, Michael Glassman, and the question is, do you separate data and information governance? Um, I focused more of my time around explain to people data governance and how it focuses into data management data management and the fact that I am responsible for both I do have some things and some of the policies that describes the difference between information and data um, but I've tried not to get too too uh, hell-bent on on kind of all the nuances I know I defined to people the fact that and when I was hired that I am managing structured and unstructured data and the complexities one of my blogs was around you know, the, the, the explosion in our data and our business, and especially the unstructured data and why that so, at times is so much trickier. Um, so that was kind of an, an interesting blog discussion. Um, so I have defined the differences, but I, I try not to get too into the, the nuances and the differences. Um, I think where I've, I've had a little bit more of kind of, you know, people understanding who does what is, I have, a, I have a dotted line to so many different areas, such as um, our analytics area and our IT areas, you know, but I'm not in charge of analytics. Um, but I am seen as a subject matter expert in analytics, and I've, I've helped heavily on things like managing um, the setup of server of a particular license and helping groups as they're migrating their, stat, their data. It helps that I've done these things. Um, and helps I understand code. Well, I'm, I, I can't spend time coding and other things. The fact that I've done a lot of systems implementations and those specifics has been really useful. And so, um, but I, I have tried not to get too um, bogged down into the nuances of those things. Really, I think, too, in this healthcare environment, I've just tried to keep it as simple as possible. And then the other part for me is, is obviously there's, there's communications going on the provider side. Um, a, a, a payer side is very different, but I've tried to make sure our things sync up really easy, that the payer folks can come to one-stop shop, um, but that if, if somebody comes to me with a provider question, I'm not just passing them off. I make sure that they have folks on their side or I answer their questions, but make sure I copy their errors. I try to make it as seamless as possible. I hope that answered. Great. Thanks, uh, Ted. Uh, we have another question from Stephanie. Um, and her question is, do you know what communications was, uh, 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 what communications around DG had been in place at uh, UPMC before, um, before you arrived? What were the most impactful communication uh, plan elements that you introduced? Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, before I arrived, there was no chief conduit, there was kind of people by committee on the payer side of the insurance services division. It was all driven out of the provider side. Um, well, I know one of the pieces that I thought was interesting um, was they, they sent out some a, a physical um, pamphlet, a one-pager on data governance, a physical piece of paper, and I got the sense that some of them arrived, some of them didn't. Some people liked having a physical piece of paper with kind of some contacts. Other people said they wanted, they found themselves wanting to copy this piece of paper and paste it into a browser. Um, so there's an example of something which I, I don't know. I'm not a big paper person, especially in an organization. But while we, we you know, we're, um, we while our, some parts of my business have expanded into 38 states, the traditional provider side is very much concentrated, and maybe it was easier and to send things in our office mail. For me. The communications that have been uh, uh, most effective, I, I was stunned that already over 10% of the folks are subscribed and, you know, almost 75% are opening the newsletter. Just stunned at that, that people are taking the time 
to once a month um, go through it. And I think it's helped of having that voice and answering specific questions and um, hopefully giving them something quick that they can read, you know, a page or two. I'm not writing, you know, novels. Um, the, the, uh, another tool that's been really useful has been the training piece. Uh, obviously it was required, but at the end of that, I put in a box that said, um, uh, basically it was an open box. They don't have to cover it, but it pops up when they're kind of grading the class that says, um, let me know an area that you, uh, is there an area that is really needed in the data governance area? And if you want to be contacted, put your information there. I mean, I've gotten some incredibly inappropriate things like my, my supervisor doesn't know anything about data, but I've gotten a lot of really thoughtful things around, you know, we really missed the mark. We've created too many access databases. Could you help us consolidate these things? Or, um, you know, we're, uh, we're excited that you're getting a data strategy. There's just, we have too many uh, localized analyses that are being done. And so um, those are some of the examples of things that have really worked effectively. Great. Uh, one more question just came in from Mark uh, Stockwell. Um, given your finance background, have you established metrics to measure the business value of data governance initiatives and critical data assets? Yeah, so the answer is yes, Mark. I mean, that's what I do. In fact, I, you know, when I was at Carnegie Mellon, besides putting dollars to data, I spent a lot of time putting returns on human capital. You know, that, you know, the things that you don't see in your financial statements. But, and Mark's done so much great work in helping gather the interest of these areas, and I appreciate the format. Um, obviously, the challenge here is, is I was building it from scratch on the insurance services division, but I have spent a ton of time, especially with the individualized plans and putting dollars to what the value of these things. So I'll give you a very specific example, which is our growth of our Anywhere Connect platform, our telemedicine, putting very specific um, dollars to, um, you know, what our goals are, the hard dollars with the, the revenue pieces, but then some of the soft goals and, and if we can learn this and we can grow it into other areas and if we can capture specific audiences and targets around what are the value of capturing um, folks in, the, for example, Pennsylvania where we don't have locations and then um, outside of those areas, what are the value of those specific areas. And so I, in a lot of those cases, sometimes I help them define the values and other times they've said, you know, for example, in a specific case around our brand, that if we can go up a couple notches on brand on this specific measure, it's worth X to us. And I said, okay, well then, then it sounds like we're willing to spend, you know, 10% of that. And if we could really actually move ourselves up the needle in this brand image piece, there's going to be some real value there. And it sounds like data is a part of that. And so I've, I've spent a lot of time in that space, and I'm really only scratching the surface. I think. In general, I'm putting value a lot up to a lot of financial and non-financial pieces here, um, particularly when it comes to getting rid of assets. The IT group has said, if you can get rid of what your plan is of these assets, it's worth X. And I'm hoping to crush it in the coming year. I really want to help groups get more streamlined and get rid of or archive these one-off databases that we've created a one-time basis. It's not exciting work, it's not glamorous, but I think there's just huge dollars there that I can easily quantify because we're not keeping these things and storing them and saving them and people going through them. And it's just, um, as we all know in this business, you know, these assets, they start to proliferate. And the end user computing, as I defined it in one of my blogs, is something that while at times it makes sense, but other times it's just, it's just excessive and it's created, it's created a, a it, it makes you lose focus from a leadership perspective. It's diverted resources, and it's and it's prevented us from focusing on the critical few. These are great um, questions. Um, maybe we can all chat. I'd love to hear some other things, or maybe people can raise their hand, or we can open things up well, more broadly we, about what they'd like to do. Go ahead. We have one. I'm sorry. We have one more question, and then maybe we could open it up. But we have one more question. Does UPMC have a data governance structure on the healthcare side that your payer side collaborates with, and are the groups integrated as one? And yeah, I, I thought I meant to cover that earlier. Wayne. There is an eight-person eight dedicated team on the provider side. They're actually part of our enterprise analytics. I collaborate extensively with them. I'm on their, I'm on their committee, but we are two completely separate groups. 
And the, the rationale was um, that, the, the, that the payer side is just growing so fast, just like the provider side, but there's just very specific and unique needs. Um, but one of the areas that we're collaborating most closely is around, uh, you know, the IDFS concept. Where, where are we most comfortable working with our legal teams and other areas? Where are we most comfortable collaborating and sharing data across the IDFS, across the payer provider, and where do we need to, to maintain those separate areas? It's been a great opportunity for us. Um, I have a small team. I only have 100% um, dedicated resource. I have open FTEs. I have a dedicated um, person on the IT side, and then I have a number of indirect resources. I have two PM project manager resources assigned. I have two open written job descriptions. I have a number of folks in the IT area that are indirectly assigned. And then I have a, a firm that's kind of helping me from, a, from an advisory perspective. So I have a number of dollars on helping me bring in experts and then particularly tied to some of the things we want to do with implementing some of the tools. We're looking at implementing, for example, some more Informatica tools where we had purchased them but really haven't leveraged the value of them. So obviously I can only do so much on my own and we're going to have a mix of internal and external implementation. Hope that answers. Ted, one other, one other question. Um, when you started out, um, did you go through a, a change management and communication strategy um, project, so to speak, that would actually um, look at, you know, what the culture at, at your organization is and what would work as far as uh, communication vehicles? So I, I, I did, Sal, and this, this is me coming, across, coming from a consulting background, I, you know, having, having worked at, at the old Anderson Consulting um, and yet having worked in the industry, I was trying to get the right balance of, of you know, being new to the organization and not coming across as you know, yet another kind of know-it-all type of outsider and the fact that, I'm, you know, I'm rolling up my sleeves and doing these things with you. Um, also, having coming directly from you know a very prestigious uh, business school, I wanted to make sure people knew that you know I, I had the background, but I'd worked together. One of the real benefits is I, I report to a steering committee besides my direct bosses, the chief um, uh, risk and compliance officer. But coming in and having this kind of direct relationship to operations, IT, health, economics, and legal. They, um, they really connected me to the heads of every one of the businesses almost immediately. And so I, I, I started at Thanksgiving, which is kind of an odd time. I helped with some fires that were kind of deal at year end where I could really help on some compliance and risk items and things where data governance was kind of critically needed. But I really spent a lot of that time through, uh, through Christmas and early into January on a bit of a listening tour and kind of listening and trying to figure out culture-wise as I – as I get into the assessment phase and then report back, you know, what's going to resonate and what won't. Um, I wish I would have spent more time understanding the things that really worked and didn't work because I feel like I've worked on something. I haven't leveraged some things that were wildly successful that I could have pushed on harder and, and some other things that people kind of had a bad uh, experience with, per se. So, for example, people – here aren't big on business glossaries. They felt like they spent a lot of time defining terms and people didn't maintain them and they didn't tie them to value. Yet when I tie them to, well, you could take this list and you could apply it right against the data warehouse and we could quickly manage some of the nuances and differences and in, in date ranges and things across there, they say, huh, well, if we had those tools and I could use them, they'd be really valuable. So I think some of those things I've kind of ran into, but I did really focus on the, the change management component in that piece. And some of that has been partnering with HR. We have a really good HR department here, and I feel like at some companies people focus so much on HR on the problems area, and I've really focused them on, you know, how are you trying to grow people from a business perspective, and how can I, from a data perspective, support it? Hope that helps. Great. Um, well, uh, I've gotten through all of the questions uh, in the Q&A area. Um, do we want to maybe open it up for uh, open discussion since I don't have anyone who's raised their hand yet? Yeah, I'd, I'd rather stop talking. I hope this was useful. I mean, I just threw together a few slides. I'd love to hear more from other folks on what was on their minds or what communication things are working for them or how we can support each other. Okay, just one thing. Um, 
please, uh, prior to um, asking your question or, or uh, speaking about your experience, can you just give us your name and your organization? And, and make sure you click the unmute button. I've done that a couple times on these WebExes, where you make sure you unclick yourself <clears throat> the thing next to you. Yeah, on the right. Well, actually, I'm about to unmute all, so that will enable everybody to talk. So just be prepared if you are, are not wanting to be heard to mute your own phone individually. So here we go. Everyone's about to be unmuted. Does uh, anyone, would anyone like to uh, share their experience uh, around communication vehicles? So Ted, this is Mark Stockwell. Um, can can you hear me all right? Do I do I have myself on? Yeah, I can. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, so uh, so I just wanted to uh, say great presentation. Um, I think it's one of those one of those topics that um, we all struggle with is how to effectively communicate um, what we're doing with data governance out to an organization that oftentimes doesn't understand um, you know what the value is of governance and uh, what role we play. So I thought it was very helpful. And I did uh, actually think your blogging idea is uh, something that I think I'd, I'd like to try. I think it's a great way um, to get little bits of information out um, to to the organization without having to, to craft something more formal like a, a newsletter, you know, content for an official newsletter or something to that effect. So uh, so once again, I just want to, I want to thank you for the, for the, uh, presenting your material and sharing your your successes with us. Well, thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. I, I often, too, when I, when I write those, I try to think, if I'm the end user, what's the takeaways? Can I give them one or two takeaways that they'll say this was useful? And I try to make sure those are clear, either, you know, overtly stating it or just making sure that those key messages come through. And I think I've gotten better at it over time. I, I feel like at first I might have been too generic. I think you have to have a little bit of your own voice, your own personality come through. I think you can see that in professional bloggers, and I'm by no means professional. Um, but it's, um, I appreciate you saying that, and uh, I do hope you'll take advantage of it. And uh, reach out to me if uh, you want to bounce off ideas, because as things are coming into me or people are saying different things around things, I'm saying, oh, I should blog about that. It might not be as applicable to the hundreds of people in the newsletter, but I'm going to put this out in the blog. What uh, tool are you using, just out of curiosity, to support that? The blogging? Yeah. Um, MailChimp. Oh, okay. I'm actually blog blogging with MailChimp, and it, it shoots out to people through a newsletter, and then I have um, a blogging tool that's through our intranet and our and my SharePoint, and people make comments and do all those kinds of things. Awesome. Thanks. Apparently, we're investing in some other tools that they want me to use at some point. I've made it clear that you know I don't want to I want to I don't want to keep switching tools on people, but I know there's a number of blogging tools that we're looking at internally. <clears throat> Is there anything else anyone wants to talk about in our kind of first collaborative session after our first sessions of making sure there was enough interest in here? Was this useful? Does anyone have anything they, they liked or they didn't Ted. like? Go ahead. Ted? Yes. Hi, uh, this is Michael Glantzman. Uh, I, I like the idea about um, blogging. My question is, I mean, I, I think it's a great idea because you can um, generate a lot of data governance leads and ideas instead of you know chasing some perceived issues versus real issues. So my question is, do you generate any feedback? Let's say somebody gave you something all over the blog. Okay, do you create a feedback to that individual? So, yes, we, we investigate, this is what it is, that, that's what we're doing, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so that's a great question. So the answer is yes. Obviously, I make sure we answer questions, and I try to get different people that are maybe indirectly involved to offer their perspectives. So I, I kind of lean on information owners or some of my direct people in, you know, IT and the PMO, which have been kind of my closest folks to it. The other thing that I've done, I was a little disappointed at first 
people were telling me the blog was really good, but I didn't think the numbers were high. So a couple of departments asked me to help them with something. And then I said, do you mind if I blog on this? And if I blog on it, can you kind of, and I hate to say this, but I forced their manager to have all of their people to make them read it. So I didn't police it, but they did. And that was a great way to kind of force content for managers to say, this is the subject I asked Ted to write about that's very specific to your area. So I kind of did the push and pull of blogging. I had them push them and kind of force them to the blog to read them. Now, I didn't necessarily, in a couple of cases, they asked me to confirm if, in fact, could I tell if people had read things or not. Um, and I try not to be over, I'm trying not to beat up on folks, but I, I found that that's been a really effective way, too, which is to, to focus on topics that are really specific there to, for me to say, yeah, I, I'd be happy to write. I'll write it for you guys. I'm going to put it in your blog, and if you don't mind, can you push your folks to read it? Because um, I think this is a really important topic, and this way you can get that level of consistency that we're all going in the same page. And in a couple of those cases, I ran it past that first person in advance because I want to be sure what I was blogging about was really in lockstep with what they were trying to do. The blogging takes time. When you get into a weekly or biweekly cadence, it's amazing how fast it comes up. Um, a couple of people were joking. They saw me. Uh, banging away before my session at uh, DG Winter, and the answer was, yeah, I'm blogging. I'm, I, ha I have content, and I want to make sure it's in draft mode. I feel like I'm always either in draft or final mode for the blog or the newsletter. It takes time. Do, do you always have, um, you know, content to, you know, to, to be fully engaged in blogging? So I've been 100% the writer of it. I've made it clear. I wrote it when I was on vacation. I, um, I read something about the, when the, how people know when a blogger is not writing it themselves, they can tell, and that bloggers often lose their, uh, their people when they're on vacation. So I read this about expert bloggers, and I just decided that for the time being, I'm going to write them. If, um, if other people get passionate about data governance and we want to expand it, maybe that's something I need to do. Obviously, in the collaboration tools like Slack, other people are putting things left and right, but I don't delegate down the blogging or the newsletter. That's my baby for the time being. Thank you. Ted, uh, this is Radhika. Um, I'm from uh, United Health Group. And I um, I agree with your what you said. It kind of sneaks up on you. I write newsletters every month, but then uh, it it's so it uh, quick it's so quick that you are in the draft mode and you publish and then you are again writing for the next one. And and uh, what I how do you like? I feel that after a while, like you uh, kind of uh, have the same ideas or run out of ideas. How do you keep it going in a way that you engage your audience? How do you come up with new things? Um, where do you get so your? a great point, and if there's a time that I don't have something, maybe I'll have to be honest and straight with people. Um, I haven't had a shortage. I don't know. There's so much going on here. Um, we just acquired HCMS, which is out in Wyoming. We've expanded eastward with hospitals. I see, I see my friend Patrick is on. We were chatting about just different things. Patrick does an amazing job over at, at Geisinger. Um, uh, I, and what I, one of the things that I do is I have on my, my devices and other things, every time I think of, a, of an idea, I quick put it down. Um, something I see, something I saw, but I, I always keep a stable. I think I have my next, it's not necessarily that it's going to be my next t 10 topics, but I have at any one time 10 to 15 topics or so of things that in a pinch I would blog on or write a newsletter about. So I, I, may, I may come up dry. Um, but also, too, one of the things that I've been doing is really personalizing things. And sometimes when it's not appropriate, I won't call out a specific thing. Or I'll say, you know, gosh, we've been in this PID audit for, for close to two years. Um, you know, it makes me think about with data, you know, um, you know, the life cycle of our data. And I'll highlight another group, you know, that, you know, you guys know about our data retention policies and how they impact, you know, both paper and on, on our, in, the, in the online world. And so some of my blogs really only had a sniff of data governance. They really highlighted in another area. And so I might do that in some of the blogs where I really am not feeling it that week. Maybe I'll just use it as a way to, 
did you know about an IT area and I, or, or another compliance area and just only have a smither of data governance pieces. But for the time being, I keep a rolling list. Um, I keep a rolling list of stuff I want to talk about. Awesome. Thank you, Ted. I think the other part with the, with the communication stuff is um, is energy. Uh, a couple people joked at DG Winter that I kind of get passionate about this stuff. Um, in my case, it was agile. I feel like we don't talk about agile enough in data governance. Um, I'm an agile certified person. I've driven the finance products for a software component in it, and I came in and embraced the agile teams. And I have a very specific role in agile tied to um, when we go to the sprint reviews, to supporting the scrum of scrums, to, you know, helping areas really flesh out the data needs more thoroughly from operationalizing, um, pr from project mode to operationalizing things in Agile. And so because of that, um, that's helped with topics too. Um, but, uh, you know, you, I think, I think too, it's, you got to kind of figure out your passion and your voice on these communications items. And so I've tried to be pumped about communications, even if I'm not feeling it that week or that month. We have about 10 minutes to go. Anything anyone wants to talk about? Maybe I can mute my line and either open it up to maybe Javita and Sal, you can talk about some things, or if anybody else wants to talk about stuff. This has been a lot of fun, but I'd love to hear from other folks besides myself. Thanks for the questions. They were great. Michael, I see your, your hand is raised. Did you have a, another question, or was that from earlier? Yeah, it's from earlier. I just wanted to make oh. sure that, you know, I don't overlap with anybody else. If anybody else wanted to start, I didn't want to, to interfere. No no worries. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, we really would love for this to be a, an interactive session. Does anybody else? Uh, have anything that they might like to share about their experiences uh, as far as communications are concerned. I mean, um, all these techniques that Ted has, um, uh, uh, you know, spoken to us about that have been leveraged at, at um, University uh, of Pittsburgh Medical Center um, Insurance Services Division are great. Um, one of the things that I guess uh, I'm interested in hearing is, um, did anyone find, you know, anything that definitely did not work for them as far as from a communications perspective or, or something that, you know, they would recommend folks to stay clear of? Um, uh, so, question for you, Ted, um, and I'm sorry, I keep on going back to Ted, sorry about that, but you're, you're the man of the hour uh, right now. Um, as far as, uh, you know, uh, communication vehicles, did, uh, you know, you've put forth several, um, you've, you've talked about the blog, newsletter, et cetera, ha has anyone within the organization um, actually uh, related to you, uh, you know, ways in which they felt either their, uh, their group or their organization would like to be communicated to, or, or has it been more uh, of, you know, let's try and see if this works and uh, see what's, what's um, you know, actually working with um, the, the masses? Yeah, so the answer is um, yes. Um, so in some areas I went to team meetings, whether it was all team meetings or, or, or breakouts of, of kind of teams or groups, so I've been happy to attend those things, whether it was to kind of talk about kind of the overall program, how things are going. In a couple cases I shared with them after I got the approval what I had shared with the president division on a, kind of our overall assessment. I shared some of the goals of data governance for us as a whole 
and how I can maybe I'd like to help them set their their specific goals. So that's been that's been a way, and they've said how they wanted to be communicated in that they they've said we, we'd like you to come out to this meeting or this specific area. In a couple areas, they've asked me if I could be a voice or a part um, on some of their projects. So. Um, you know, I always have to be care careful to make sure people know I'm the second line of defense. You guys own the data. Uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm one person. I, ha I have another person. I have these, you know, resources in IT and other areas, but we're very focused on building a program. That's where having access to a firm like Infotech has been useful. I've tied them into those areas. A couple people have loved being able to search through um, the, the resources at, on, on a site, you know, or Gartner, one of these other things, and being able to get these things and then reach out to me if they have questions on it. So that's been one way of communicating, of giving them access to some other tools that they could kind of search on. Um, when it came to a project, I was specifically asked to help. They were really concerned about the data testing, and they said, you know, we would have liked to have brought you in earlier, but this is a piece that, that go live. and. Um, on one of our lessons learned, we feel like we didn't test this very specific area. We'd like your advice on how to attack this. And so, you know, I, I kind of became the consultant again, you know, where I put my consulting hat on it. And um, what was nice about that was I was integrating with my broader um, go governance risk and compliance. So it was actually somebody I didn't know in my own group who was saying, hey, look, before I'm going to be doing a quality review in this area anyway. Um, before I do that review, why don't you work, you know, you're working with Ted, you're working with these other folks, so let's, let's make sure that you're, uh, that you're comfortable with those areas. So that was a good way, too, to work with the part of our area. Um, so for, and it was also kind of working in advance of any kind of audit or other kinds of work on a system that had been live for less than two years. So those are some examples of how they've asked me to communicate with their folks. Sometimes it was coming out Excellent. to their meeting, sometimes it was can I, and then I also, you know what, another tool that I've done that this was a really interesting one, on my blog I, I have little buttons that say, you know, share my newsletter. You can forward it to another colleague. I ask that certain things that they keep internally, but it's really easy for them to forward and share things. Um, and I encourage them to do so in their groups. Hi. Four minutes left. <laughs> Four minutes to go. Yeah. Yeah, right, go ahead. Yeah, good. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, I, I, this is Patrick East. Uh, Ted, thank you. Uh, great to hear from you again, and, and thank you for the shout out. Um, Ted and I uh, both work at, at uh, Health Systems in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, I'm at Geisinger. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention uh, very briefly is the concept of a, a business vocabulary, and uh, which is one of the things that we can use a business glossary uh, now. To talk about business vocabulary and using a business glossary to support the discipline of business vocabulary in communications could potentially be more of an information governance, right? I don't know how we want to slice that. But um, if, if you're using a term in your blog or other email communication and you have a glossary tool which allows you to, say, uh, embed hyperlinks directly to term definitions, that's uh, an approach that, that I've used with emails. I don't have a blog, but use, in emails, when I use a term uh, that maybe not everybody knows the definition of, but we've already coded a definition for that term into our business glossary, we'll provide a URL directly to that so everyone can understand the common and accepted usage of the term. So I wanted to throw that out there. Man, I love it. I, you're right, Patrick. That's a great way. For those of you, I, I said, and Patrick uh, Gies gave a fantastic presentation for a vendor around how he was he was using some of the tools, and I think he's just ahead of me when it comes to some of the um, business vocabulary and business glossary kind of adoption. That's a great idea. I didn't even think of that. That I can just tie those right in since these things become integrated, and it'll take them right into it without them knowing. What a great idea! I'm writing it down as we speak. <laughs> Okay, great. We we have four minutes left. Is are there? Is, does anybody else uh, want to you know contribute or or say anything uh, before we bring it to a close? I have an, another question for Ted. Uh, this is my sure, last one again. Ted, in your experience, what type of communication um, or information? is not very effective or appropriate for blog as far as data governance is concerned? Um, 
So, um, so I was looking at some of the communications that were existing in the health system, so whether it was on the provider side or the payer side, and um, I'll be honest, a lot, some of these folks are assessed out, and some, you know, there's so many, we're so regulated, I think we're like number two compared to banking, so I have not beaten the head over them over the head with, you know, according to Medicare Section 6, you know, level eight, I've, I've tried to stay out of those kinds of things. That's been an area that I just don't feel has been as successful. I've tried not to over delve them into kind of the nitty gritties of compli excessive compliance. Obviously, I'm, I'm a compliance area, but you know, too many ties to as per policy and these things and really try to keep it conversational. I just, I've read too many communications that are too long and that read too much like somebody's copying and pasting. I try not to copy and paste, period. There's times I get other ideas from things and I quote and I highlight them, but I try to force myself not to copy and paste because we all have the internet. So I try to, with these communications, what am I writing about this that makes it worth writing? And for me, that is t taking something I might have read about or might have been thinking about or might have saw and tying it specific to this business. Um, I, I, I just don't write things that somebody has already written and it's written really well. Um, be because what's the point? I can just put a link to it on my intranet. So I usually take something that's been on my mind or that people have been talking about and, and write about it with a specific tie to this business, mm -hmm. to our business. Were you? Yeah. Um, that, that's great. Over there? Um, with that, um, we're, we're at the top of the hour out. here. I just wanted to um, uh, thank everyone for joining yeah, uh, us today so on the SIG. Please mute yourself, whoever's talking. I wanted to um, thank everyone for joining us here on the SIG, and we look, I hope, way some you know something about you that you didn't know before and thank you very much and look forward to see you next time yeah i'm take looking care. forward to the panel thanks for everyone coming on i appreciate the questions this has been fun i hope it was useful take care